Well, because this young man is, quote, according to law enforcement officers, screaming and shouting that the FBI is almost here. We all need to go away. He has God's hammer. This is war. We're all going to die. We're going to talk about schizophrenia today. You probably have heard of it or bipolar disorder or schizoaffective disorder. There's lots of different mental health conditions that are on a spectrum. Today, we're going to focus specifically on schizophrenia. And today, I want to take a different approach with you. I want to teach you and introduce you to schizophrenia like I do to our medical students or our residents that we teach. I think this is going to help lock in several key concepts in regards to brain development and the processes that are involved with schizophrenia. Let's start with a case. We have a 21 year old man who has no prior past medical history, hasn't seen a doctor for anything significant, has no prior personal psychiatric history. And what ends up happening is he gets brought into the hospital by the police. Law enforcement have picked up this young man outside of a restaurant. And why? Well, because this young man is, quote, according to law enforcement officers, screaming and shouting that the FBI is almost here. We all need to go away. He has God's hammer. This is war. We're all going to die. This young man is fixed and he is focused. He knows that the things that he is saying are absolutely true. And he's trying to warn other people and tell them about it. This causes quite the disturbance outside the restaurant. That's why the police were called. That's why he was picked up and brought to the emergency room. As we talk to the family and those related to him, particularly his girlfriend, who joins him in our hospital emergency room, she says a couple very interesting things about him. She says that about nine months ago, he began to become more withdrawn. He wasn't as interactive. He wasn't as social. In fact, he started ditching her and his family and friends. He seemed to be acting weird. She couldn't really describe this weirdness, but thought maybe something was going on inside him, maybe inside of his mind. She just couldn't quite put her finger on what was, what was going on, what the change was. And then he stopped going to college. In fact, he ended up being suspended. As we dig a little bit further in his history, we find out that his grandmother ended up passing away in a state hospital. His mom, apparently according to him and the girlfriend, is just crazy. She's flat out crazy. In fact, that's why he ended up being raised by his uncle in his uncle's home. Now, as we do a neurological exam and a physical exam on this patient in the emergency room, we find that things are pretty much normal with him, except when we start to really ask him questions about why he's in the emergency room and why he thinks the FBI is coming and who this individual is that he says has God's hammer. In fact, the more we question him, the more guarded he becomes, the more suspicious he becomes of us. His eyes begin to shift and we notice some eye movement changes. And as he's talking to us, he gets more irritated. He gets more agitated. And then he continues to say the same thing. It's war. Zudu has the hammer. Zudu has the hammer. We back off as a medical team. We come in, we offer him some food, we offer him some water, make sure that he's feeling okay, that he doesn't feel threatened. When we offer him the water, he says it's poison. And now he believes that we're trying to poison him here in the hospital as part of the plan that Zudu has with his hammer. This case is what we typically see as neuro hospitalists when it comes to the first presentation of schizophrenia. So let's talk about how schizophrenia is actually diagnosed. There's some critical things that we need to talk about in regards to the diagnosis of schizophrenia. Several of these conditions have to be met in order for us to diagnose somebody with schizophrenia. Number one, you need to have two of the following symptoms for over one month. Delusions. What are delusions? Delusions are fixed false beliefs. The FBI is coming. Zudu has God's hammer. The water is poison. Fixed false beliefs. 
or hallucinations, which are different than delusions. Hallucinations are seeing things, and sometimes individuals know that they're actually having them and that they're not real. Disorganized speech or scattered speech, disorganized behaviors or catatonic behaviors. In other words, maybe the patient becomes immobile. They don't move. They have very slowed and deliberate movements. In fact, as it's almost as if you're moving things very robotically and slowly, or they have repetitive movements. They keep doing the same movement over and over and over again as they're trying to talk or express things to you. Or when they're only by themselves, you observe them making these repetitive movements. And they need to have a couple of the other things, social withdrawal. You'll notice in the presentation of our 21 year old man that this oftentimes precedes the psychosis or oftentimes can precede the fixed false beliefs or the delusions. He was withdrawn for nearly nine months, was ditching out on his girlfriend, not hanging out with family and friends. You can get a flat affect, meaning that the individual becomes less expressive. They're able to state things and talk, but they don't show the typical facial expressions with the emotional components that are appropriate when we speak or talk. They may have decreased energy. That decreased energy some people think, well, maybe they're just feeling sick and that's why they're not hanging out with us as much. They don't have as much energy. But that's oftentimes also accompanied by a decrease in their motivation. Now, these things are very critical for us as we talk about this moving forward. And if you haven't watched our Brain Basics video yet, I highly recommend that you do it. You can click on this link and you can watch the Brain Basics video. That's going to be important for you to understand where in the brain these symptoms are coming from or being expressed from. Now, there's a couple key characteristics that I also want you to think about when we're discussing schizophrenia. And one of them is that schizophrenia often presents and nearly always presents in early adulthood and late adolescence. Early adulthood and late adolescence. It's oftentimes preceded by the social or even occupational withdrawal in functioning. As you'll notice in the case of our 21 year old man, not only was he withdrawing from his family and friends, he was enrolled in college, but he also withdrew from college. In fact, he was suspended for that. It's crazy to think about this, but in patients that are diagnosed with schizophrenia in this way, we see that compared to the normal population, their life expectancy is decreased by 20 years. That's 20 years of life that is lost in individuals diagnosed with schizophrenia. So Dr. Chandler, what is the cause? What causes schizophrenia? Why does it happen? Am I going to get schizophrenia? Is my loved one going to get it? Am I at risk of developing schizophrenia? What can I do to keep my brain healthy or protected from this? Let's do a deep dive into this. Number one, I have to tell you, the brain is the most complex thing, system, and organization on earth. There's over 40 billion connections, trillions of synapses, and hundreds of trillions of neuromolecules and biosignalers that occur in the brain. And I'm not even talking just the pure volume of neurons. It has electrical activity. It has blood flow. It uses minerals and ions and hormones. All of those things communicate and coordinate in order for us to understand and perceive the environment that we have. In order for us to think autonomously and independently. And in order for us to interact with one another and with our society. So when we start talking about mechanisms of action, and neurodegeneration or changes in the brain, its structure, its function, or its synapses. These things are highly complex. And to get to the bottom of it, to dive deep to the very bottom of the cause, we just haven't done it yet. As neurologists, as a scientific community, as psychiatrists and psychologists, no one has identified the exact cause of schizophrenia. It's not like there's a red button that you can push or point to and says, yep, that's what causes schizophrenia. It's way more complex than that. But I'm going to get you as close to the absolute truth 
and perhaps cause of schizophrenia as I can. Let's start with the genetic and environmental components that are associated with schizophrenia. Schizophrenia happens when your brain and your mind gets affected by not only genetic but environmental factors that happen early in brain development. Well, how early? We're not 100% sure, but I'm going to get you close to it. Form and function of the brain are affected. In fact, the form, the structure of the brain, and the function between brain neurons within the synapse, the space where they communicate, is affected long before we ever see the symptoms that we've discussed. Now, I want to take your mind back to early in the womb. As a baby or a child's brain is developing in the womb, the brain is growing, creating, and generating hundreds of millions of neurons. These neurons are growing, and when they grow, they reach out and they're trying to connect to each other. Dendrites, the little particles on the end of the cell body of a neuron, are reaching out. The axons that connect neurons to neurons are reaching out. They're trying to touch one another, establish a connection, trying to help us think, maintain awareness, alertness. They're programming and preparing your eyes to see clearly, your ears to hear, your mind to think, and your language centers to be able to speak and understand. As those neurons are growing and as they are functioning, there's a specific type of cell in the brain called the microglial cell. Now, you can't just dump everything. You can't connect everything together without organization, planning, or structure, and without reinforcement. The systems just don't work. If I take pieces of a tree and a whole bunch of random letters and I throw them all together in a box and shake them up, I'm never going to get a dictionary. I'm never going to get an organized, concise way to read, to have letters organized to understand words, then to have letters spaced after that to give me a definition of what the word means. It's the same way with neural development. It has to follow, follow a pattern. It has to follow a program. That's what is happening in neural development. Those microglial cells come through and they begin pruning or cutting synapses that are not being reinforced and that the brain thinks are not necessary for it to fully function throughout the rest of your life. In pruning, oftentimes we have an abnormal pruning process that can happen in the brains of individuals that have schizophrenia. That's the main theory behind what's going on. If I have a connection that's trying to make another connection with a neuron, and I cut it out, and I prune it, and I'm left wanting that connection, or I have an abnormal signal coming in from something else, maybe I'm hearing a voice that shouldn't be there or that isn't actually there. Maybe I have a part of my occipital lobe starting to try to see something that actually isn't being seen and sent through my eyes to that part of my brain. Maybe I'm hearing a voice that isn't a voice that's actually speaking to me, but it's a creation of my own neural networks trying to connect because the neurons have been cut or pruned in an abnormal way. What we see oftentimes with brain scans, in fact, we can see some of these things with EEG mapping or functional mapping of the brain, is that we have less synapse production in the brains of individuals with schizophrenia. In other words, the connections between the neurons, their total density has decreased. And we also see over pruning. There's been too much pruning that happens. So with less connections, the brain may hold up for a while, but not for too long. This is why the typical presentation of individuals with schizophrenia is in late adolescence or early adulthood. Think of it like a bridge. Your brain is like a bridge. It needs structure. It needs things to hold it up. Maybe ropes or cables that keep the bridge intact and suspended. And as you've had abnormal pruning during the development, some of those cables are cut. Maybe one of the support structures has been wiped out underneath it. It's okay over the passage of time for some vehicles to travel, for people to run across the bridge. But by the time you hit 19, 21 years old, that abnormal pruning in those brain connections 
that aren't as robust as a good strong bridge collapses. And when the brain collapses, you get the psychosis associated with schizophrenia. Well, what do you mean the psychosis? I mean the delusions, the hallucinations, the disorganized speech, the fixed false beliefs, the auditory hallucinations, the individuals talking, you talking, you assuming something else is going to happen. The brain's bridge, its structure, the pruning neurons have collapsed in schizophrenia. It's very interesting to note, and like I said, I'm going to get you as close as I can to understanding this, but understanding within the complexity requires effort on your behalf. Think about it. There are 108, 108 schizophrenia associated markers that we know of that exist within genes. So within genes, there's markers, 108 of them, that can be associated with schizophrenia. These markers are associated with an even more complex process. We've talked about the structure, the bridge, the pruning, but these gene markers determine how much dopamine is synthesized, an activating molecule in our brain, a, a, a molecule that helps us with mood, motivation, it helps us with aggression. Calcium channel regulation is affected by these genes, and so are glutamate neuroreceptors. Now, we've discussed glutamate neuroreceptors before in our other videos, and I strongly invite you to go back and view all of the content that we have on the channel, especially the content regarding alcohol when we talk about glutamate neuroreceptors. In schizophrenia, it's not just the glutamate that may be produced at an abnormal level, it also is a receptor called an NMDA receptor. NMDA receptors are also differently regulated in patients that have schizophrenia because of the genetic expression that happens from these markers. Now look, it's not all about genetics. Just because one individual in your family may have suffered from a mental illness or may have schizophrenia does not mean that you will. Just because you have a gene doesn't mean that that gene is then going to be expressed just like a pair of jeans in your closet. Just because you have it in your drawer doesn't mean they're going to be put on. It doesn't mean that you're going to wear them every day. It's the same thing with these genes. Not all genes are expressed, and not all genes are expressed at the same time. There's also environmental factors that contribute to the development and the expression of schizophrenia. In the scientific literature now, sometimes these are referred to as pollutants. And yes, that does mean environmental pollutants. But oftentimes we're starting to use this term as pollutants for the brain because there's many things that can pollute our brains. A couple of these things or environmental factors that I want you to remember that can contribute or increase an individual's risk to develop schizophrenia or advanced paternal age. Advanced paternal age when your mother and your father get pregnant. If the age is significantly elevated or older, you are at an increased risk of developing schizophrenia. Prematurity. If you're born very premature, you're at an increased risk of having schizophrenia. Remember, this isn't that hard to understand. We talked about pruning. Pruning that happens between the synapses and the neurons in childhood development, within the womb. In fact, there's two phases of pruning that happen. Pruning typically happens most predominantly within the womb and in the early stages of life after birth. That pruning then stabilizes in late childhood, only to pick up again in late adolescence and early adulthood. It's actually a process of learning, if you think about it. If I want to get good at shooting the basketball, I don't just shoot the basketball with my right hand, then shoot the basketball with my left hand, and then bounce it off my head to try to get it to go in, using a whole bunch of different connections. Instead, I want to reinforce and integrate ingrain one, one process, ingrain one smooth movement to get that to happen. The brain's doing the same thing with pruning in late adolescence. I want to trim away all the fluff so I have a fast signal that I'm used to, so that I can think quickly, so I can understand quickly, so I can speak quickly and interact with my environment quickly. Some other things that can happen are stroke-like events, particularly hypoxic ischemic events. Sometimes those happen within the womb. 
trauma, severe trauma early in your life, or even early parental death have also been associated with this. Why? Can you help, help me make sense of that? Can you help me make sense of that, Dr. Chandler? Sure. If you're a young child and you have a massive traumatic event that's presented to you, your brain may start to prune in an abnormal way to try to protect you, to try to reinforce pathways or processes that it seems or it has interpreted as being protective for you. So that can happen with trauma or early parental death. And then another one of these environmental pollutants are things like substance abuse. Now, if you were paying close attention, you will have noticed that in our case of our 21 year old man, he had no alcohol or drug use, but his girlfriend had reported that he had tried marijuana once or twice. If you haven't watched our video on marijuana, now is the time to do so. Because increased use or use or early exposure to marijuana and substances similar to it in late adolescence and early adulthood can be a trigger that collapses the bridge and can be the final straw that breaks the camel's back in regards to somebody presenting with schizophrenia. So now that we've talked about some of the causes, some of the genetic factors, I'm going to level up your game and we're going to go from undergraduate to medical school and now into like residency medical training when it comes to what happens with the brain in schizophrenia. All right, so here we go. These are the PhD level brain changes that we see and observe and have imaged and picked up on other types of neurological studies within the brain in patients with schizophrenia. Number one, decreased synapse densities. How dense are the regions that have all of the molecular signaling? Those are decreased in patients with schizophrenia. Decreased neuronal connections, the axons connecting one neuron to another. This is also seen in decreased gray matter and decreased white matter. What is that, Dr. Chandler? Easy. Gray matter is the darker substance of the brain that is on the outside of the brain itself. This is like you picturing all of the homes in a neighborhood. It's where the meals take place. It's where the conversations take place. It's the cell bodies. In schizophrenia, that gray matter is decreased. It's thin. The white matter tracks are like your information highways. Everything that happens in the gray matter where all the thinking goes, then has to send that signal out and down a white matter track. Those white matter tracks are also decreased in schizophrenia. So not only are the synapse densities down, the neural connections down, the gray matter where the thinking in the cells happen in the brain and the white matter, the signal sending in the brain goes down, but the whole brain volume decreases. This is very important and one of the reasons we have strongly encouraged you to watch our Brain Basics video. Because decreased gray matter and signal connectivity and synapse density in the frontal lobe affects an individual's ability to perform higher cognitive functioning, planning, and understanding how to interact appropriately with the environment. This changes our ability to think. Decreased synapse densities, neuron connections, decreased gray matter, decreased white matter in the temporal lobes make it much more difficult for us to process auditory input, the things we hear. It makes it very hard if those synapses and those connections are glitching out to understand if that voice is coming from within our head or if that voice is something that I've heard outside of myself. If my occipital lobe where I see has been affected by this, well, now maybe I'm starting to have the hallucinations that we talked about or illusions, things that seem to be perceived as normal, but maybe they're not. Maybe if my occipital region of my brain is affected and I have schizophrenia, if I draw a star, it's not crisp on the edge. Now it swirls 
because I can't interpret the image that I'm trying to portray as crisp and as clear through robust signal synapses in neuronal connections. The other thing that we see over and over again in studies, and perhaps one of the most early findings we had on neuroimaging, brain imaging, is that there's an increased ventricular volume. What is ventricular volume, Dr. Chandler? It's easy. Your brain sits within the skull, but within that there's fluid called cerebral spinal fluid. That cerebral spinal fluid helps cushion the brain and keep it where it needs to be. That cerebral spinal fluid is made and circulated through pockets and rivers of fluid that go through the brain called the ventricles. The ventricles are the fluid filled spaces in the brain. In individuals with schizophrenia, these fluid filled spaces in the brain expand. They get much larger. In fact, that's one of the earliest things that we see is that we see ventricular expansion or the volume of the ventricles increase. So all of these things worsen over the course of the illness with schizophrenia. Now, I hope that you've developed a good understanding of schizophrenia. The best way to think about this is to frame it within a case. And we talked about the 21 year old man that presented to the emergency room that we subsequently diagnosed with schizophrenia. Think of him, use him as a case example for you to remember the things that we've talked about. Now, let me give you a secret. The eyes are the window to the soul. And one of the key findings, in fact, one of the most early ways that a very observant neurologist can pick up whether or not someone has schizophrenia is to look at their eyes. Our eyes have different types of eye movements. We have psychotic movements, rapid, quick movements of our eyes. But our eyes also have to do what is called smooth pursuit, where we go back and forth very smoothly. We see that we have a significant abnormality in psychotic control and smooth pursuit in patients with schizophrenia, even early on. That means that their eyes may bounce. They may not be able to move them smoothly. Or if they look for something, they look and then have to come back to latch onto it. Look and have to come back onto it. It's just one of those fun, critical, cool things that you learn as a neurologist over time when you're trying to help people get better. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed and learned what we've talked about today. If you have, share it, like, make sure you're subscribed, and don't miss our next video.